Let's invoke God's blessing as we begin the message. Father, this time I pray that you speak either through me or in spite of me. Let those with ears to hear, hear the word. It's in Christ's name that I pray. Amen. When I was in junior high and just a baby Christian, I used to have this ritual to, to uh, try to discern God's will. Whenever I had a difficult decision to make or I wanted God's direction on something in my life, I would go out back and I would shoot baskets. I would take a basketball, I would hold it out in front of me and I would say something like, okay God, if you want me to ask out Sarah in my English class, then I will make this next shot. And if you don't, then I'll miss. And then I would toss up a shot with God's will hanging in the balance of my basketball skills. Now I'd like to say that my ability to discern God's will in my life has matured past the silly Gideon sheepskin-like tests of God. But like many of you, a lot of my prayer life is some kind of version of asking the Lord, God, what am I supposed to do? Please tell me, please, please make it clear. Doesn't that seem to be the main reason that we pray at all? What do I do, Lord, about my daughter? What should I, what should I do about taking this job? Where should I move? What, what am I supposed to do with my life? And oftentimes, the more we seek God's will on a matter that is really important to us, the more stressed out that we become. And that sort of hurts our ability then to discern what God is saying to us, which increases our desperation to hear clearly from God. Daniel was serving in the court of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, who had set himself up as king of kings. Now, the Babylonian bully was a dangerously impulsive man. He's the monarch who ordered Daniel's friends thrown into a fiery furnace to be burned alive, amongst other crazy, horrible things. He was as self-absorbed as our modern-day politicians, but he was also as dangerous as Hitler. Well, the tyrant was haunted in the night by a dream. Look at the text. It's in Daniel chapter 2, starting in verse 1. In the second year of his reign, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams. His mind was troubled and he could not sleep. So the king summoned the magicians, enchanters, sorcerers, and astrologers to tell him what he had dreamed. When they came in and stood before the king, he said to them, I've had a dream that troubles me, and I want to know what it means. Then the astrologers answered the king, May the king live forever. Tell your servants the dream, and we will interpret it. Nebuchadnezzar, destroyer of nations, goes on to set up an impossible scenario. Not only does he require his magicians and enchanters and sorcerers and astrologers to interpret his dream, he won't even tell them what the dream was. They have to first discover what he dreamed, and then they have to tell him what it means. Now, dreams can get pretty weird. Last night I dreamed I visited Disney World, but every street had four feet of water, and the entire park was really flooded. So the options are, well, they're both limitless and kind of bizarre, making guessing someone's dream pretty much impossible. Oh, and here's the clincher. The king threatens death by mutilation and annihilation of their entire households. Look at the text. Verse 5, the king replied to the astrologers, This is what I have firmly decided. If you do not tell me what my dream was and interpret it, I will have you cut into pieces and your houses turned into piles of rubble. So this pompous, superstitious nightmare of a king breaks the first rule of seeking guidance. You must take the pressure off. It's essential. Pressure nearly always guarantees you'll have a hard time discerning what God is saying, if you hear anything at all. Pressure, it, it clinches up your heart and your soul. It, it ties your insides in rubber band knots. And even if God is shouting, it's unlikely he can get through to you because of all the chaos. Daniel appears to understand this. He was a wise man after all. His first move is to buy himself some time to go and to pray about it. Thus calming the situation down. And he asks his friends to join him in prayer with him and for him. And Yahweh answers. And here is Daniel's praise. Skip down to verse 20. Praise be to the name of God forever and ever. Wisdom and power are his. He changes times and seasons. He deposes kings and raises others up. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to the discerning. He reveals deep 
and hidden things. He knows what lies in darkness and light dwells with him. I thank and praise you, God of my ancestors. You have given me wisdom and power. You have made known to me what we asked of you. You have made known to us the dream of the king. There is something powerful to be learned in praying and proclaiming in our souls what we know is true. God can and does reveal mysteries. He clears things up. He makes things known. It's why Paul prayed the way that he prayed. It's what he prayed for the Christians in Colossae. Look at Colossians chapter 1. Look at verse 9. For this reason, since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you. We continually ask God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all of the wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives. It's the same thing he prayed for the Christians in Ephesus. Look at Ephesians chapter 1, verse 15 through 18. For this reason, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all of God's people, I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. Did you hear that? Wisdom and revelation. We need both. Sometimes wisdom holds the answer. Sometimes we need a revelation from God. And the key to receiving answers to prayers for guidance is to let go of our constant attempt to figure things out. Stop constantly trying to figure it all out when you pray. It's almost incessant sometimes. I'll be in the midst of seeking the God of the universe on some issue that I need guidance on, and in the midst of asking him, I'm thinking through the options. I'm trying to figure it out as I pray. God has some rather strong feelings about those who choose to walk in the light of their own counsel. He doesn't mince words on this. Isaiah chapter 50, verse 10 and 11. Let the one who walks in the dark, who has no light, trust in the name of the Lord and rely on their God. But now, all you who light fires and provide yourselves with flaming torches, go walk in the light of your fires and of the torches you have set ablaze. This is what you shall receive from my hand. You will lie down in torment. Those are some strong words. It is truly pointless to seek God's counsel while you're privately committed to one specific course of action. If we're going to pray prayers that work, we must surrender our agendas. We have to learn to let go of our secret desires. And once we do, we'll be in a much better place to receive God's thoughts on the situation. Trivia time, are you ready? What is the very first command in the Bible? Not as in what's the first of the 10 commandments, but what's the first ever command of God in scripture? I'll give you a hint. It's found only three verses in. Genesis chapter one, Verse three, and then God said, let there be light. That may not sound like a command at first, but it is. God calls forth light before he even creates the sun. He commands light. Now all throughout scripture, you see God's people crying out for his light to shine upon them, to illuminate their path. For example, the psalmist said in Psalm 43, verse 3, Send me your light and your faithful care. Let them lead me. Or the famous Psalm 119, look at verse 105. Your word is a lamp for my feet, a light on my path. We need to learn to pray. Let there be light. God is the source of all clarity and truth and wisdom and revelation. God's light shines light on all things. That's what the psalmist said in Psalm 36, verse 9. For with you is the fountain of life. In your light, we see light. The light of God, the light that preceded the actual sunlight. It is the luminosity of God's presence. It's an actual thing. It's, it's not just a metaphor. When the angels visited the shepherds on the night of Christ's birth, the Bible says, the glory of the Lord shone around them making the night like day. In your effort to discern God's will, ask for the light of God to shine over you and your situation. So let's bring this all together, maybe into a way 
that you can pray for guidance and clarity and revelation. Let's get practical. First of all, do whatever you can to reduce the pressure. Do what you can to reduce the pressure. Pressure is a killer. It nearly always gets in the way of hearing from God. As best you can, lay down the pressure as you seek guidance. Drama never helps. Stress never helps. Give the search some breathing room. In fact, maybe take a deep breath yourself. Second, be open to whatever it may be that God has to say to you. If you are in truth only open to hearing one answer from God, yes, you should buy that house, then it is not likely you will hear anything at all. More sadly, if you do hear a yes, you won't be able to trust it. Surrender is the key. Yield your desires and plans and hunches to the living God so that you can receive from him something far better, his counsel. And don't fill in the blanks. Don't spend half your energy trying to figure it all out while you give the other half to seeking God. You do not want to walk in the light of your own fires. Far better to live with the uncertainty for a little while than to be your own counselor. Finally, when it comes to major decisions, give it some time. Don't try to get this all done in five minutes. I think we have this idea in our head that prayer is just talking to God. It certainly is that. But don't forget that prayer is also listening to God too. It should be conversational. It involves give and take. And that takes time. Prayer is not making speeches to God. Prayer is entering into conversational intimacy with God. There is fabulous intimacy and effectiveness available to us when we pause and let God say something in return. I love what Jesus says in John chapter 10. He says this, I tell you the truth, the man who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate, but climbs in by some other way is a thief and a robber. The man who enters by the gate is the shepherd of his sheep. The watchman opens the gate for him, and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes on ahead of them, and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. Whoever enters through me will be saved. He will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. I have other sheep that are not of the sheep pen. I must bring them too. They too will listen to my voice and there shall be one flock and one shepherd. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. Four times in that passage alone, Jesus repeats himself, and probably it's to make himself perfectly clear. His sheep hear his voice. We are meant to hear the voice of God. Jesus is describing his relationship with us and, and how he's the good shepherd and how we are the sheep in his care. And he warns us that we live in a dangerous country. There are wolves and there are false shepherds. There is a thief who comes to steal and to kill and to destroy. The only hope we have to stay safe is to find good pasture. And we do that by following our shepherd closely, lovingly, tenderly, and yet firmly. Jesus is urging us, don't just wander off looking for pasture, looking for the life you seek. He says, stay close. Listen for my voice. Let me lead you. And to be clear, I'm not talking about an audible voice as as I would talk and, and listen to you. Ephesians chapter three tells us that Jesus dwells in our very hearts. I'm talking about listening for his gentle voice within. I'm trying to offer you some really practical advice. So I wanna give you one last idea that I wanna ask you to try to help you cultivate conversational intimacy with God. It's this, start by asking him a question you already know the biblical answer to. God, do you love me? Scriptures already answer that. Yes, beyond all doubt, he does. But asking that helps warm me up to the practice of listening because Jesus is able to tell me once again, of course I do. 
and my fears melt away and the pressure starts to lift. And then I can return to the essential truths of my relationship with God. I am his child. He loves me. We're good. Let's talk.